Uh, welcome. Uh, today's going to be a pretty special day. Um, we've got some great speakers in town. Um, we're here to honor a very special person who set up this opportunity for us overall. Uh, but we'd like to start out the uh, we'd like to start out the morning with a few words of welcome from our brand new chancellor. Uh, chancellor Chris Maples has been on campus uh, four days and oh, three days and about twelve minutes. Um, <laughs> so. And just a couple quick words, uh, Chris comes to us after being the president of Oregon Graduate Institute. Uh, he also had fairly long stints at the Geologic Survey of Kansas, uh, so no stranger to the Midwest. And he was also one of the leaders of Desert Research Institute, which has a very, very broad uh, research profile. So he's very steeped in the traditions of geotech, or excuse me, um, of geological uh, aspects. He's a geologist by trade, so this kind of matches up well. And I had the opportunity to just run across him, uh, pass with him last week before he even started, and he offered to do this just at the drop of a hat. So thank you, Dr. Maples. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Welcome to Missouri S&T, and for many of you, it's like you've been here a lot more than I have. It feels sort of odd to welcome you, <laughs> almost. Um, I'm, I'm interim chancellor. Um, if you're going to do this in the Apple mode, that would make me the I chancellor uh, <laughs> for the campus. Um, but it is my absolute honor and pleasure to, to welcome you all to the 2017 GMO conference. But before we start with anything, I would really like to thank Dr. Shamsur Prakash uh, and Sally Prakash for their generosity to make this lecture series possible. So please join me in an applause for both of them. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Prakash, as many of you know, um, is a recognized internationally for his many contributions to the study of soil dynamics and earthquake engineering. Um, he served this university for more than 20 years before his retirement in 2000 and is now Professor Emeritus of Civil Architectural and Environmental Engineering. And, and I'm thrilled also to welcome to our campus the distinguished Dr. Richard D. Woods, who's here in front, a member of the National Academy of Engineering and a Professor Emeritus of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Michigan. And I think he is an absolutely perfect person to kick off this series. Um, he will present the first of what will be many Prakash Distinguished Lectures here at Missouri S&T. And we're really proud to be able to do that. Geological science and engineering have always been important here. I mean, this was at one point the Missouri School of Mines and Metallurgy. Um, of the school's first three graduates, two were civil engineering and one was mining. And this is really, in large part, part of our DNA, part of our history, part of how we started and part of what we use to spring from, grounded in the past, but not constrained by it as we move forward as a university. This emphasis on geotechnology has continued throughout its history and throughout the name changes that have gone on with this university to today when it's Missouri S&T. So I really welcome you all. I'm delighted and honored that you're all here. Delighted that Dr. Woods is starting off this lecture series indebted to the Prakashas for doing this lecture series. And I will hand you back over to Dr. Joel Birkin with my thanks, gratitude, and deepest appreciation for all the time to take to be here. Thank you all. Thank you, Chancellor. I really appreciate your time this morning. And we expect great things over the next year, right? Right. All right. All right. No, no pressure. No pressure. Um, <laughs> And again, that, that was a, a very nice thing. He was squeezing us in between meetings. He's going to run across campus now as the next one, so, uh, so thanks to him. Um, and uh, just a few words about Shamsher, um, and he'd like to say a few words as we kick off. Um, I, I came in 1996, and I thought Shamsher you know, really just started. He's such a young spirit, uh, and his approach to his work, I think, was appreciated by many. Um, he impacted people truly across the world. Uh, he joined here in 1978 and retired in 2000. Um, as a professor emeritus in the field. And I think one of the things that we really see a, as an impact was the case studies that, uh, in geotechnologies that has now been picked up by ASCE as a lecture series. 
and he held those across the country and also is very active holding similar workshops in India, which is where he actually met Dr. Woods for the first time, I believe. Is that accurate, where you first met was in, in India? In India, I'll yeah. Um, Shamsher has uh, many accolades, which I, we, we will not go through all of them, but he's a distinguished member of ASCE. He received a gold medal from the Kazakhstan Society of Service to Geotechnical Engineering Worldwide, so showing his true global impact through his career. Um, he's a distinguished alumnus of the Indian Institute of Technology uh, for his contributions in earthquake engineering, as well as being a distinguished alumnus of the University of Illinois, and he was just inducted into the Academy of Civil Engineering here as an honorary member. So to, to have every institution that you've had a contact with throughout your career basically put you in the Hall of Fame says a lot about your impact and your quality of person. Your accomplishments are one thing, but when people recognize those accomplishments and then put it with the quality of person and, and how you've taken those accomplishments and your skills and talents and applied it to the people you've impacted, I think that says a lot about Shamsher. Um, so through that, uh, Shamsher and his wife recently established the Shamsher Prakash Foundation. Uh, not recently, this has actually been going on for quite some time. And I love the purpose of this. Uh, I, I want to say this exactly as it's written. Uplifting mankind through yoga, geotechnical engineering, education, and peace. The foundation has made over 66 awards worldwide on a variety of levels. Um, and it has hit 20 different countries. So to think of somebody who you know, had a little office and a uh, civil engineering building here in Rolla, Missouri has now impacted 66 people through his generosity around the world in 20 countries is really impressive. And that is after his career in education. So to continue those impacts well into retirement is absolutely amazing. Uh, and with that, uh, Dr. Prakash uh, set up the uh, lecture series that we're going to kick off here in a moment. Uh, and this will be the inaugural one. So the Dr. Shamsher and Sally Prakash Distinguished Lecture Series is now open. Would you like to say a few words, Shamsher? I am very happy to welcome Richard Woods today for the inaugural lecture of the series. I'll just say a few words about Richard Woods. He used to come to Rurki in 1980s when I was professor at IIT Rurki. And they were setting up the IIT Kanpur through US cooperation. And he was one of the distinguished members of the committee. In 1983, he came with a purpose, gave a seminar on um, behavior of pies under dynamic loads based upon his student glee. He tested 85 meter long piles in Michigan, in clay, and two of my students have thread wear analyzed those results again, and they got their PhD. <clears throat> now, when I came back here in 1978 uh, as a visiting professor in engineering, I shot courses, and he was one of the principal speakers in, on machine foundations, because he and his peer Frank Richard, they were good friends of mine. He was uh, also chairman of the Soil Dynamics Committee, uh, Geotechnical Engineering Committee of the ASC, and he gave a couple of state-of-the-art lectures to my foundation, to my seminar. So I've al always enjoyed his friendship, patronage, and contact. I wasn't sure he'll accept the invitation, so I asked Joel Burkan to initiate the invitation. And I'm glad he's here and will enjoy listening to him. Uh, last year he was in India, first time. And I met him there first time in India <laughs> after a long time, 1980s. So welcome you, sir, and we look forward to your lecture again. I, I thank Joel Burkan for nominating for the Academy. I was the senior most member of the Academy when I was inducted in 84 years old. Other people who were inducted were 60, 50 year old. <laughs> <laughs> so with these words, I welcome you all, and I hope you'll enjoy the show. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shamsher. Standing. 
uh, thank you, Shamsher, again for the kind words. Um, but most of all, again, for making this opportunity possible for us. And this is the first of many. Um, and we're honored to have as the inaugural speaker, uh, Dr. Richard Woods. Uh, as you've heard already, he's a professor emeritus from the University of Michigan. Um, and he's also a National Academy member uh, inducted in 2003. Uh, over his 40 years in academic career, uh, he's graduated over 20 or 21 doctoral students and authored over 150 peer reviewed publications, as well as authored uh, three uh, textbooks that are widely used in the field overall. So you really think of the impact of that, of sending out that many, you know, if you will, disciples of what you've done that go into education. How many have gone into, on to be professors? No, about half. About half. So yeah. the impact of that and trickle down is going to be tremendous and he's impacted many people through his educational work. Uh, as far as his research, he's been involved in some of the, the largest geotechnical projects on the globe, including the Tarbella Dam in uh, Pakistan and a number of nuclear plants that have been built around the world, including uh, Michigan and Brazil. Um, and with that, uh, he was some of the lead uh, geotechnical uh, expertise on some of those projects. So very highly respected, not just in education, but in practice around the world. Uh, his many awards, uh, as we've, as I had to pare this down, it's like three pages of awards when I started looking at this. Uh, he's also a distinguished member of ASCE, as is Shamsher. Um, he was a GI hero in 2012, uh, the Terzaki lecturer in 1997, and received the Collingwood Prize in 1969, um, as well as I said before, a uh, member of the National Academy inducted in 2003. And I, and I think most importantly today of all of those, he is the inaugural speaker in the Shamsher and Sally Prakash Lecture Series. Dr. Richard Woods. <laughs> Someone's going to have to help me get this changed. I feel like I'm wired up here for an electric chair. Anybody <laughs> just switch this? <laughs> Correct. There you go, sir. All right, now, am I coming through the speakers? Yes. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you, Dr. Birkin, for that uh, wonderful introduction. I think there may be some exaggerations in there, but uh, <clears throat> we'll have to live with those for the time being. Um, <clears throat> it, it certainly is a, an honor beyond any that I expected to, to be um, selected by Shamsha Prakash to give this uh, inaugural uh, Shamsha Prakash, Sally Prakash, uh, distinguished lecturer here at uh, Missouri University of Science and Technology. Um, I, I, as uh, uh, Shamsher indicated, uh, our uh, knowledge of each other goes back to, I think, 1971, when I first visited Rurki when I was uh, uh, teaching for a term at uh, IIT Kanpur in India. So we have had quite a, a long uh, extent of, um, of um, mutual um, uh, interests. Um, Professor Prakash has written textbooks in soil dynamics, which is also my field. Uh, we haven't overlapped very much in terms of the details where uh, he was concentrating on a pile soil interaction and uh, liquefaction. Uh, I was uh, um, more uh, concentrated in measuring soil properties in situ uh, and in the lab, and a more uh, a later part of my career in promoting the use of geophysical methods in geotechnical engineering. Uh, I just also would like to just point out to, to you who, who weren't around in the early 80s when uh, uh, Shamsher uh, had the grand idea of, of, of promoting uh, international conferences on recent advances in soil dynamics and earthquake engineering. Uh, I was a, a part of the, the um, uh, administration of the soil mechanics and foundation division at the time, and, and there was a, a, some consternation about the possibility of an individual at a small university uh, beginning th these um, uh, important 
uh, particularly important at that time in, in, in the life of geotechnical engineering when nuclear power plants were being built around the world, that uh, this individual could uh, uh, mount a important conference, bring many international uh, participants, and then carry on for another six conferences of the same title and a second series of conferences in, in, uh, on the, uh, the topic of case histories. Well, Shamsher pulled it off. Uh, many people were surprised, but uh, they turned out to be uh, probably one of the leading conferences in geotechnical engineering throughout the world. And we certainly owe him a debt for um, uh, organizing and bringing the, the uh, conferences on recent advances in soil mechanics and uh, soil dynamics and earthquake engineering and case histories uh, into the world uh, to provide um, knowledge for the future. So again, thank you, Shamsher, for your lifetime's work, and, uh, and I, I thank you for the honor of uh, being able to present this uh, uh, inaugural uh, Shampshire and Sally Prakash lecture. So I'll get into it now. Um, <clears throat> over the past uh, eight years, uh, I've been working with our Michigan Department of Transportation in helping them uh, <clears throat> solve or at least find a temporary solutions to two kinds of problems that uh, have uh, faced them. And um, based upon these eight years of, of work, I have arrived at a, a certain point uh, which, in which we can talk about the consequences of vibration from high energy sources in the construction industry. And in particular, my examples are from highway engine, engineering. However, there are many uh, demolition activities which uh, create uh, even more energy than, than the uh, uh, kinds of operations I'm going to describe. But I'm not going to get into blasting. Uh, explosives will be uh, out of the, the range of, of my uh, uh, to a presentation today. Well, what are the elements that we need for analyzing vibrations, trying to pick the, uh, or to predict, I should say, the uh, uh, amplitude and consequences of vibrations coming from construction operations? Well, we have to know something about the source energy, the magnitude, and, and uh, how it is generated. We need to know how that energy is coupled from the uh, particular tool that's being used into the ground. And that has been a, a, a weak point in terms of um, the simple process of driving piles. It uh, looks like it ought to be a simple process, but it turns out to analyze it, it's rather complex. And, and I don't think we know the whole story yet. But then once we have coupled the energy into the ground, then it has to be transmitted through the ground to targets uh, of interest. And, and that can be uh, pipelines, uh, uh, sewers, uh, and of course buildings and other bridges in the uh, high, highway system. Uh, once we have uh, estimated what the amplitude of motion might be at a target, how much damage is it gonna do? What's the criteria to judge whether that is too much vibration or not? So the, the two projects which have led to eight years of work are, are shown here. The, um, uh, <coughs> I'm trying to get my arrow at this, this point on a, a bridge in which half the bridge has been demolished to be reconstructed uh, and uh, piles, uh, have been driven, the inclined piles, the battered piles, were uh, set with a vibratory hammer uh, and uh, 
a number of vertical piles and you can see um, a number of uh, sheet piles in the background uh, have already been uh, uh, driven. And uh, one day as they were driving the uh, battered piles, uh, the street on which that drill rig is resting settled a foot in a matter of a minute. And uh, uh, this, uh, for this particular situation, it did not cause any significant damage because this was a secondary road going under the freeway. But uh, uh, their uh, worry was, is this going to happen in other situations as we replace foundations with piles, spread foundations with piles? The, the other example we see here is a pavement breaker. Uh, there, it's a fairly common practice now to, to break pavement um, before repaving and in some instances leave the rubble in place, compact it, and uh, pave over it. Well, in this case, as the paver, pavement breaker was going along, it caused liquefaction. And the question is how far out? Well, fortunately, this was a rather flat area, but uh, nevertheless, the, the phenomenon occurred. So the question is then, uh, what caused that pavement to settle? And uh, what caused the liquefaction to occur uh, at pavement breaking? And all of this is an issue of change in volume. If the disturbance is sufficient to change the volume, mainly of sands, uh, uh, then you have the possibility of a shakedown settlement or a liquefaction with a buildup of uh, pore pressure. I just uh, show you so the, the range, not that, uh, that I expect you to come here to look for the energy of any of these devices, but they're seven order of magnitude in the, the range of energy uh, from a, a few foot pounds to a, a billion foot pounds. Uh, and and, and uh, you can see where some of the common tools fall along this line. I think it's interesting that dynamic compaction uh, <coughs> provides, outside of blasting, uh, the, uh, the highest uh, energy input. And uh, pile driving uh, has a range uh, down here, so something like from uh, uh, about 10 million uh, Foot-pounds, uh, I suppose, down to <coughs> when we're in the order of uh, thousands and <coughs> 35,000 to 65,000 is fairly common for pile drivers. Some other uh, mechanisms which generate energy, um, I don't uh, intend you to think that these are all that are possible, but uh, three possibilities with, with the, the common vibrating roller with the eccentric mass inside, uh, the impulsive processes which impact pile driving is, and uh, the possibility of vehicles uh, running over bumps. And uh, uh, <coughs> this is, the vehicle problem is probably the most difficult to uh, predict. Um, because it depends on the suspension of the vehicle, uh, the amount of uh, load, and uh, of course the, the height of whatever is the um, object that it uh, might be hitting. Now I have included um, uh, references to <coughs> most of the slides that are not my own, and uh, I included a reference list at the end in case you have interest in pursuing um, uh, any aspect of, um, of, of what I can present today. Just as an example, the talk about the large energy, and this, this is the dynamic compaction uh, process, and it uh, was uh, being implemented for the new airport for uh, Nice in France a number of years ago, but uh, this represents a pretty major piece of equipment and dropping it from a, a, a height uh, created substantial energy. Now, pavement breakers. I put this back up again because just a, a moment I'm gonna 
go on to the equipment and their possible energy. But uh, the uh, crack and seat, break and seat, rubbleization, breaking for removal are high energy construction operations in the uh, uh, highway industry. As I say, I present this so that you can see the kind of a, of a tool that might be used where we have just a slab of steel being raised and dropped on the pavement. The, the point is uh, about the maximum I could find in the rated energy was 108,000 foot pounds. Um, there may be um, uh, other, other manufacturers that produce uh, larger equipment. And here is a, a robotization uh, d device that has multiple drop weights. And uh, uh, this, however, has only a rated energy of uh, 64,000 foot-pounds. We'll be using these numbers uh, a little bit later in an actual uh, uh, calculation. Uh, you're familiar with the, the, the common pile driving equipment, uh, diesel hammer and, and uh, hydraulic hammers, but uh, the range of energy that um, uh, MDOT uh, uses, uh, the, the hammers uh, selected by the contractors to drive uh, piles for the Michigan bridges range from about 35,000 to 65,000 uh, foot-pounds rated energy. That's not necessarily the energy that uh, gets uh, into the ground, but we'll talk about that also. All right, so we've seen some of the uh, devices that create the energy. How about coupling that energy into the ground? Because if we don't couple it into the ground, uh, then it won't be transmitted to any distance uh, and it will not be a hazard to um, uh, uh, other uh, facilities, uh, I guess I should say. Um, so uh, I'll be making a, or showing a calculation, just the end result of the calculation uh, for pavement breaking and an impact driven pile. But let's see how we can get the energy from the pile into the ground. And the various operations, we saw this before, but the red arrow shows where the main struts, beams in this case of concrete, have been broken away. There, there was other major demolition at this site um, for the abutments, the old abutments to the bridge. But trying to, uh, or, yeah, trying to estimate a coupling of energy from a jackhammer or whatever tool is being used to break the concrete into the ground is, is a, a pretty weak connection. And, and I think maybe you can appreciate that if you look at the, the kinds of tools that are often used, the whole pack or, or whatever the contractor calls it. Uh, but the, the, the problem here is that we're creating energy hydraulically in this unit and, and breaking um, whatever concrete or, or just rock here. But the, the coupling of energy here is rather inefficient. Uh, you, you can't couple much back through this arm. You lose energy all the way. So uh, this kind of a device does not, is not expected to uh, uh, to, to create more than uh, the, the hazard of noise. And, and uh, you'll get a lot of objection because of uh, the noise that it might create. Okay, so here we see the, the uh, pavement breaker again and uh, the damage that it has done. Uh, and we'll talk about the coupling uh, in, in just a moment for that kind of a device. But let's first look at, at uh, piles impact-driven piles. Uh, some time ago, Atwell and Farmer uh, suggested that from driving piles, uh, we would create spherical waves and uh, there would be a shear wave and a primary wave. We'll just call it compression. It's not exactly that, but that's close enough. Uh, secondary and primary, because it's another way to define them. But 
two, two waves going out from the pile, uh, uh, cylindrical in form. Uh, later, uh, I took a look at this and, and uh, tried to refine that um, uh, model slightly. And so here we see the hammer impacting the pile, the energy traveling down the pile, uh, the up and down motion of particle motion in the pile. And what happens along the shaft of the pile, we transmit some energy into the surrounding soil. And uh, the, uh, the earlier models did not incorporate the uh, shaft energy. And of course at the tip, I uh, still certainly agree that we are uh, creating body waves of spherical form and the sphere gets larger and larger as you get farther away. But they're probably, in the ideal situation, two kinds of waves, the shear wave and the P wave, traveling on this spherical front. The shear wave motion tangential to the circle, and the P wave, the motion is perpendicular to the circle. And uh, there'll be some rays that will encounter the ground surface and be reflected and at a certain distance from the, ham, uh, from the pile uh, will generate some shear wave. Now, I, I now have reservations about whether it's a Rayleigh wave just because of the, the uh, particle motion, and, but uh, it's a, a surface wave of uh, some sort. Now, how, do we, how does energy get transmitted? This is the pile. And for that pile to be driven, it has to move relative to the soil. Otherwise, you're not driving the pile. So if, then there's going to be shear along the interface between the pile and the soil. If the pile does not move more than the soil, once again, you're not driving the pile. So there has to be a fairly large strain and <laughs> Of course, large strains, that's, what are we talking about? Fractions of a percent, but nevertheless, those are large strains. So what could be the maximum transmission of a up and down, in other words, a shear at the interface, what could be the maximum value? Well, you, you, you couldn't be able, you wouldn't be able to transfer more energy into the soil after the soil has failed. So the maximum transfer will occur at the maximum shearing strength. And the maximum shearing strength, well, what do we do? We get the vertical stress is equal to Z, the depth, times the unit weight. And then we convert that to horizontal stress using the coefficient of lateral earth pressure we get a sigma h. And then the stress against the pile, well, do we need to really have the, the uh, sand on pile friction? It, the sand will fail, say, with one or two grains into the sand in, in any case. So the maximum uh, strength that we can get there is the frictional strength of the sand. So we get a shearing strength that is the, the uh, sigma h times the tangent of, of phi. Now, some of the terms that go into to, uh, the final equation for particle motion, which is z dot, and that's vertical velocity. How fast is this wave going up and down that's created by the shear? The, terms that uh, enter this are sometimes difficult to get, particularly in, <laughs> in a highway department type project where the only information they're going to give you is blow count. And uh, you, you may request much better soil materi uh, uh, material properties, but blow count is what you get. So <clears throat> we have tried to make correlations 
uh, of low count to unit weight and, and then to uh, K naught and finally to friction angle so that we can get this equation Z dot, vertical particle motion, maximum that can happen simply because of strength of the soil. Z dot is equal to the shearing stress divided by mass density divided by a shear wave velocity. Well, the shear wave velocity has to be modified somewhat, and the shear wave velocity V star sub S is some factor times V sub S. Now, why is that? Because right at the pile interface, we're going to get the maximum shearing uh, particle motion in the sand, and the shear wave velocity for that maximum strain is low. I hope that some of you, most of you have heard of, of modulus degradation in terms of how modulus decreases with increasing strain amplitude. Velocity follows that same kind of a path. So very near the, uh, the pile, the shear wave velocity is less than small strain shear wave velocity. Small strain is what we generally measure with cross-hole tests or, or um, SASW. But we have to modify that. And how are we going to modify it? Well, we modify it, can use this kind of a, a diagram uh, from Massarch. Um, uh, Reiner uh, Massarch in Sweden was trying to <coughs> cause vibration to cause settlement. That was his goal, to drive piles to make the sand settle, not to avoid it as we might in a highway operation. But here we have plasticity index. And if we have a nice clean sand, that means we're way over here at zero. And then uh, Reiner uh, kind of uh, uh, suggested there might be four different levels of difficulty in penetrating the soil. And consequently, this shear wave reduction factor, R sub C, uh, will depend upon how difficult the driving is. And for a sand with uh, zero plasticity, there are four values here, ranging 0.2 to 0.45. So you have to make a decision in, in what that value would be. At that point, then, we would have the peak particle velocity in the sand, starting right at the interface, diminishing, getting smaller as we go farther away. We'll talk about that attenuation in a moment. So now, looking back at this <coughs> impact-driven uh, pile, then we will transfer energy. Oh, I should be looking at the circled one down here. Uh, the, uh, the energy transmitted into the soil in terms of peak particle velocity diminishes as you go farther from the pile. And we need to know how that diminishes. And we'll look at uh, that as a, as a possibility in just a, in a moment. Now, <clears throat> we've seen the shaft coupling, energy out of the shaft into the soil. What about the tip? Certainly, we're transmitting or we're coupling energy out of the tip of the pile into the surrounding soil. And we generally consider that uh, to be in the form of a spherical wave. And the particle motion, it's a spherical wave. The rays are along radii. So here is particle motion in the radial direction, in every radial direction. Uh, on a spherical wave front. And once again, very close to the tip of the pile, the strain amplitude will be very large. The reduction in shear wave velocity from the uh, small strain value will be a significant number. For sands, any kinds of sands, um, uh, our, our research has shown that, that two is close 
it's for a uh, single uh, 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 digit uh, uh, precision, that's the right number. Uh, it, it might be 1.85 and it might be 2.25, but we're generally in that range, range for loose to medium sands, and they're the sands that are likely to give us problems. So the radial component of particle velocity is two times r sub r times the ratio of the impedance of the soil divided by impedance of the pile. Now in these two, uh, two terms, we have quite different quantities. The mass density impedance down here, area times mass density uh, times uh, velocity, velocity of the wave uh, under consideration. The area of the tip of the pile is the same as the area of the soil that it's encountering, so the A's cancel out. But mass density, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, uh, probably at, at least uh, the weight of concrete, unit weight of concrete compared to the unit weight of soil, but it may be steel, so we may have uh, uh, something the order of uh, 480 pounds per cubic foot over the acceleration of gravity for the mass density of the pile and something quite different for the soil. But then even the next term, velocity of what is the wave in, in being um, uh, imparted to the tip of the pile in a steel pile, 17,000 feet per second. In the soil, underneath, uh, I, I think it should be the um, BO wave of the second kind, but that's getting too complicated. Uh, probably the P wave velocity in the skeleton of the soil. And 2,000 feet maybe. So we have, uh, feet per second, sorry. And we have uh, the ratio then of 2,000 over 17,000, which is an um, important term. And then the energy, rated energy, the square root. Um, however, seldom do we get 100% of the energy from a pile driver down to the tip of the pile. The uh, dynamic pile analysis uh, programs will give you an estimate of the energy getting to the tip of the pile. Maybe that's the best we can use now, and it usually comes out about 50%. But the point is now we have a way of determining particle motion on this sphere and in the radial direction uh, at the tip of the pile. So we have essentially taken the, the uh, two components uh, uh, of uh, uh, energy transmission coupling uh, and have ways to make the calculation. For example, if we have a pipe pile 14 inches in diameter the area of the pile and the area of the soil that it encounters are the same. Uh, so we take a look at this equation. We can plug in the number two for the R sub R and appropriate numbers for, uh, in this case, the soil and the pile and energy. When we do that, at 10 feet away from this pile, particle velocity in the radial direction. That's this yellow vector uh, is about two inches per second at 10 feet away. And just for comparison, we take the pavement breaker. If we have a slab of steel being dropped that's eight feet wide, one foot thick, um, and perpendicular to the screen, uh, and uh, uh, we pick the energy that I showed you on one of the earlier slides where this drop uh, breaker had about 100,000 foot-pounds. We take that same 100,000 foot-pounds, <coughs> we apply it. Well, now what do we do? The pavement, maybe 10 inches thick, uh, maybe more, but in any cases, in any case, uh, the uh, assumption uh, at this stage is to, to uh, 
assume that the energy from the pavement breaker, the steel, passes through the pavement to the soil. So that in this equation, uh, we use the um, QP is for the pavement breaker, and the QS is soil again. Well, it's kind of interesting because when we make a calculation using 100,000 foot-pounds with that pavement breaker and uh, uh, the uh, mass density and velocity in the steel, we come out with just about the same value. We get a Z sub R at approximately two inches per second. So these are the coupled energies uh, from the shaft and tip of, I'm sorry, uh, just of the tip of a pile and the base of a pavement breaker. So if we get a certain particle velocity uh, into the soil, then how is that attenuated with distance? And uh, uh, so we have the tip with the spherical waves traveling outward. We have the shaft with essentially cylindrical waves. There's a slight incline to them. And at some point, uh, we might sum the particle motions. And for uh, our purposes of looking at the damage caused by pile driving, we want to look at the vertical motion. So we can sum the components uh, in vertical motion at any particular point in the field that is being disturbed by driving the pile. Uh, I have uh, avoided talking much about the surface wave, and, and that, of course, is what most measurements have made up to very recent years. Uh, but we'll include that in, in just a few moments. Okay, now transmission and attenuation. Once we have calculated, estimated, I, I would say better, uh, the uh, uh, ground motion amplitude at the pile shaft or at the pile tip, then we're look, we want to look into the soil around the pile being driven. And <clears throat> we have two kinds of damping that are prevalent. The first is geometric, simply meaning we start out with this sphere, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it contains, we we'll say, the, the same energy, but the energy density is getting lesser. The amount of energy per cubic foot. So this is just geometric damping. And along the surface, there is attenuation of the surface waves, and um, uh, they attenuate at slightly different rates, and we'll see that in a minute. But there's also material damping, particularly close to the pile. When you're in the zone very near the pile, amplitude of uh, particle motion is very large. And so there is hysteretic type damping or material damping that occurs in addition to the uh, uh, geometric damping. There's another kind of, um, of damping that we have not included and I have not seen it quantified yet, and that would be the a sort of a pseudo damping that comes about from reflections and refractions of the rays as they travel away from the pile. Uh, they break up the wave and, and uh, uh, if, if you study the, uh, the, the elastic behavior at interfaces, you see how that happens. Uh, it's a very complicated process, and depending upon the layering, it could really be uh, complicated. So it is often, no, not often, almost always ignored. Uh, so well, how about the attenuation? How is the, the uh, energy, uh, how is the particle velocity decreasing with distance away? Well, this is just a representation then, uh, an idealized, uh, Rayleigh wave, and uh, at a distance R1 from the source, the amplitude is A1. At distance R2, it's A2, and so on and so forth. But we can compare amplitudes 
A1 and A2 if we know either one. But generally, we're going to know, particularly in the pile along the shaft, we're going to know the first, the highest amplitude. And we'll call that A1. And, uh, and this would be maybe at the radius of the pile. But, and we can predict then the amplitude at A2, knowing the distance, with this equation. And uh, well, I didn't write it here, but uh, we generally call this the Bornitz equation. And I'm going to be publishing a, a, um, a note in the Geotechnical Journal uh, uh, what, uh, supporting uh, the uh, designation as, as the Bornitz equation. In any case, if we know A1, we can find A2 based upon the distances R2 and R1 uh, to some power. Well, this is the first power for body waves, and it, it is the uh, n is 0.5 or a square root of, for uh, surface waves. So this is the geometric part of the damping, and then we have the material part of the damping that can be expressed this way and other ways, but can be expressed as the e. E, which is the base of the natural logarithm, to the power minus alpha. Now, alpha is the key. That's the attenuation of ground motion. And it's in units of one over distance, one over feet or one over meters, whatever uh, units you, you want to use. And uh, then the, the difference between the, the distance to R2 and R1. The complication here is that alpha is a function of frequency. But if you know alpha at one frequency, you can estimate it at another uh, with this simple uh, expression. It is a complicating factor because it does mean that uh, the attenuation rate depends on frequency. And if you measure frequencies from a driven pile, impact driven pile, I look at all the frequencies contained in a uh, Fourier analysis, close, and we have many frequencies, high frequencies. You get farther and farther away, out here at 50 feet away from that pile, most of those high frequencies are gone. So it's a, a different range uh, for, uh, for alpha, uh, depending on, it, it is different with the range uh, away from the pile. <coughs> uh, now, just as an example of comparing the two parts of that equation, uh, if the circles are data points and we might put a, a line representing ge geometric damping through it and uh, use this, this line, you might choose a different line, but just for argumentation, this is just the slope of attenuation. That's distance, and here's amplitude distance down here, feet, meters up above. How it would, how the amplitude of particle motion would decay due to damping from distance only, geometric damping. But if we fit the Bornitz equation through these data points, then we'll, we, we can find out as a matter of fact, we can calculate what the alpha is that represents that curve. But, for instance, at a distance of, well, let's say 500 feet, which is about here, the amplitude according to the combined damping, particle velocity about, what, 0.05 inches per second, <laughs> considering just geometrical damping, we're up to a, about 10 times that. So the, the material damping can be quite important, particularly at long distances uh, from a source. And I recommend that we use the, the Bornitz equation with both components. How about alpha? Now, it mean, it's nice if you can measure alpha in the field. You go out and actually uh, put out sensors and you drop a heavy weight and you measure what the attenuation is. Well, this is just an expression that, that, has been, that can be developed from 
a single degree of freedom system, and uh, in this equation, uh, alpha is 2 pi. D is the damping ratio of the single degree of freedom system. And for soils that may be down in the range of less than 2%, but uh, very small. Uh, and frequency is in there. And velocity of the particular kind of wave that you're attenuating, because all of the the body waves and surface waves can be attenuated uh, according to the Bornitz equation. In any case, we're after alpha. That's over here. Uh, we can enter with a wave velocity, say a shear wave velocity, uh, 10, 20, well, oh, this is meters, okay. And uh, uh, then we come down to a particular frequency line and across and we'll get a value of alpha. This is one way of estimating in advance. However, you'll note this whole chart is based on a damping ratio of 4%. It, you could put in there 5% and get a different chart, 2% a different chart, but uh, this, this is what it would look like. Uh, if, if you take uh, exper from experience, um, we can correlate alpha with blow counts, and you see here uh, four different classes of soil, uh, four different alphas or ranges of alpha at five hertz that can be converted based upon the simple frequency expression and related to blow counts. So for less than five blows, we're likely to have uh, an alpha in this range. And you see this is the larger value of alpha. As we go to higher blow counts, stronger soil, the alpha is a smaller value. Way over on the right, there's some simple uh, description of the kind of soil that, that might make up this, uh, that might fall into a class one, a class two. It's difficult to work as an engineer with a class one, very weak soils, difficult stuff. Also, uh, we're getting into uh, hard rock when we get up to class four, so it's usually in this range, but you have to adjust for frequency. Now, criteria. If we have coupled the energy into the ground, we have attenuated it a certain distance, we have resolved it into a vertical particle motion, summing the uh, energy from the tip and the shaft, then are we likely to have damage? Well, there can be direct damage to structures, breaking of glass and window and so forth, uh, damage due to settlement. And this is something that is often ignored, but the shakedown settlement due to driving piles can be, as we saw in the, uh, <coughs> uh, the first slide that got us started in this direction of inquiry, Shake down settlement due to driving piles. Uh, and damage associated with uh, uh, people, uh, that uh, they're just uh, disturbed and they don't like it going on, so they shut it down for the night time. You can't drive it. Okay, there are a bunch of recognized standards, and uh, so uh, here are some of them, and just as sort of a quick review, uh, starting in about the 50s, uh, two inches per second was considered a limit for structures. But here is the international standard ISO organization, you, and here is the Acoustic Society of America, and they have standards for uh, um, vibration. Uh, here is this two inches per second, which was considered a standard probably through the 1950s, and it was based mainly on, on mining. But then it was recognized quite, well, probably uh, 70s into the 80s that frequency was uh, quite important. Therefore, there are different ranges for the allowable particle velocity at different frequencies. While we used to just say two inches per second for the whole range, not so anymore. And here is, uh, the Office of Surface Mining in the United States, the German uh, uh, DIN for uh, 
for um, uh, standards for vibrations and uh, some other conditions. And you'll see that in each case, these have at least one shoulder associated with a frequency. So uh, frequency is an important factor in our decision for um, judging whether an amplitude is excessive or not. Uh, here is uh, another set of measurements in which we have uh, drywall and wet plaster. And uh, the, the drywall is more tolerant of uh, vibrations than, than the wet plaster. This will crack earlier is what, what it really means. Uh, then there are the, the blue criteria are for um, I mean, sensitive structures, uh, uh, very old structures, antiques, antiquities. In other words, we need to, to um, uh, keep vibrations substantially lower uh, in the case of um, historical, historical is what I want to say. It's written right out here. Just read my <laughs> slide. Um, okay, but then we can get into the very sensitive uh, situations where the da Vinci uh, surgery machine, which uh, I have had the pleasure of uh, uh, experiencing, uh, it needs to be very quiet for, for its uh, successful operation. Uh, we know then that, that for a, an operating room, we need to have a quiet zone for other kinds of things. For instance, like making integrated chips, you have to have a quiet region as well as clean. <laughs> clean rooms <laughs> need to be quiet. And there are various levels uh, of limits, and we'll just indicate uh, here, for instance, this uh, VCB from NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Testing, uh, say uh, with a VCB and the maximum level indicated here, uh, approximate standard for optical microscopes. And in uh, laboratories, you need that sensitivity. For extremely difficult sites, of the VCE, difficult criterion to achieve in most instances, and instances, and the uh, NIST has uh, um, proposed the, the most sensitive for trying to cite uh, <coughs> instruments and research facilities on the ground, uh, and the uh, the limits are shown here. Well, what you see, the the actual lines were measurements made at different depths in the ground due to traffic from a secondary road. But in any case, these all were, fell below the criterion. And uh, the, this is probably the most sensitive uh, <clears throat> that you deal with these days. Now, one of the possibilities for damage that I indicated earlier was settlement due to vibrations, and vibrations caused by pile driving. And the roadway that triggered much of this research uh, dropped uh, a foot very quickly, but it was because of the accumulation of strain associated with driving many piles. Not only that, but driving piles in soils which have this band of particle sizes. We're sticking with the uh, soils that are essentially uh, above the 200 sieve and uh, uh, th that are essentially um, considered clean. Yes, we'll say clean because we'll keep the fines out. All right, so at what amplitude of vibration are we going to trigger settlement? Well, this has been a question in earthquake engineering since we really started studying in 1964. And we have a threshold, and we'll get to that in a minute. But how do we calculate the strain? Well, particle velocity. We know how to calculate particle velocity. And to get the 
shearing strain, it's particle velocity divided by shear wave velocity. It has to be at the appropriate strain, of course. Uh, for a volumetric uh, strain, uh, we take the radial um, particle velocity, and there should be a dot on that, sorry, missed that, uh, divided by the P wave velocity. Basically, we're looking at shearing strain because that's where the research has been done to find thresholds at which a loose sand would start to change volume. And when it changes volume, pore pressures are generated. And so these are the various people from as far back as 71 uh, up through 2004 that uh, sort of the 0.01% was uh, accepted. Uh, the, the last three researchers here reported that, well, maybe it's less than than 0.01% um, shearing strain to cause settlement, particularly if you have a lot of cycles. Uh, now, uh, here we're talking about 10 cycles, uh, and Brandenburg and Massarge were talking about many cycles, maybe thousands of cycles. And that's what happened at the uh, site where I showed you the one foot rapid settlement, accumulation of cycles. We're not there yet. We don't know how to, to uh, account for numbers of cycles. All you can say is that if you get to this shearing strain, then you're at a threshold where settlement may occur. How much settlement? Don't ask me. I don't know yet. But I would know to be concerned about shakedown settlement. So that's what happened at, at this the location. It was accumulation of pile driving, both vibratory driving and impact driving that uh, led to the, the settlement at this site. So with respect to the pile driving, is there a way we can estimate whether or not we're gonna have, uh, we're going to reach threshold if I'm driving this pile, am I vi going to be exporting vibrations large enough to cause threshold strain? And uh, so we attempted to make measurements in cooperation with the Department of Transportation in the state of Michigan. Most of their pile foundations are H piles, as we see here, and the leads. Now, these plastic bags are simply the surface manifestation of, of the cables, connecting cables to sensors, buried sensors. We buried sensors at three distances from the pile at two different depths as close as two inches to the pile to attempt to find out what is the maximum particle velocity that the pile driving generates. This was our hypothetical model. This is the way we expect the soil behavior. Right in close to the pile, very large strains, we called it a plastic zone. Don't, don't get too detailed about that definition. And then another zone a little farther away, which is a nonlinear zone. And finally, the nearly elastic zone, which is far out and, and the typical uh, uh, Bornitz equation will <coughs> correctly uh, follow the attenuation. Now, what is important to, to realize here is that the particle velocity quite close to the pile, if the pile is down here now, and the particle velocity right close to it is very high, but it bleeds off very fast. It attenuates both geometric and material. But the reverse of that is that right close to the pile, the strains are very high. So if you look at modulus and shear wave velocity degradation with strain, we start out with a low shear wave velocity and that velocity increases as you get farther and farther away. Uh, I've indicated some possible sh ranges down here, shear sure, sure strain. D don't take that as, as a fully established. That's just the idea in this uh, model. 
have also indicated some values of alpha down here at the bottom. And of course, the alpha is largest, cause the quickest attenuation, closest to the pile, uh, gets a little smaller. And uh, finally, uh, the, uh, the typical low strain values. Well, two sites, <clears throat> I'm going to present the data from two sites, uh, and these are at M139 and US131, so two different kinds of uh, highways. At uh, M31, we had two borings in which the blow counts, here's depth, here's blow count, here are the blow counts recorded for the two borings at this site. And then the shear wave velocity measured by the MASW method is shown here, velocity versus depth. Uh, this is for one site, here it is for the other. I just wanted to, to show you that we have blow count and we have shear wave velocity uh, uh, measured uh, right alongside of the uh, pile sites. The uh, <coughs> transducers to measure particle velocity, one, two, three, one, two, three, two depths. And along the surface, we started, or we, yeah, we, we uh, uh, the closest we got along surface was two meters from the pile and then on out here to almost 20 meters. Uh, so we have both in-depth and surface measurements for driving the pile. What do the amplitudes, the measured amplitudes look like? <clears throat> here is the depth of the tip of the pile. So if the pile is down here at six meters, the amplitudes measured in the three transducers are shown here. This is the depth of the upper sensor velocity transducer. And you'll notice that the particle velocity for the closest, 0.2 meters away from the surface of the pile, increases as we approach the, the uh, sensor. Below the sensor, uh, there's uh, some wiggling around, but uh, a fairly constant value of amplitude for the intermediate and the farthest, uh, <clears throat> these are the data. For the other sites, here is the location of the sensor. Oh, by the way, these upper regions, uh, this, the soil was so weak that uh, in the first place, you just put the weight of the hammer on and it went down, and then you hit it with one blow and, and it wouldn't uh, uh, send the, uh, the, the diesel slug back up and piston up in the air, so you had to raise it by hand. So the point is, the blows there were useless. Uh, and, it, and they didn't create any sensible vibrations. So uh, until we get to, uh, looks like here about 10 feet, about three meters, uh, we don't have data. But the point is the closest transducer as the pile is getting closer to that transducer, the amplitude increases. And then below that uh, uh, remains uh, about constant. And here's a, a deeper transducer, but the trend is exactly the same. Um, and how, why would this occur? Well, it's, it's quite evident, I think, if we're looking at a deep sensor, then the only ray that energy that gets there is out of this spherical wave. It's a pile tip generated uh, vibration. However, if the pile has gone beyond a sensor like this one, then there is energy from the tip arriving at that sensor as well as energy from this shaft uh, traveling to this sensor. So the amplitude increases when the point of interest or the sensor is below the tip, increases to a maximum value. After the pile has gone by 
a sensor or buy a depth that you're interested in, we find that the amplitude remains fairly uh, stable. And this can be seen quite easily by plotting the data in a slightly different me method. We plot the diagonal distance from the tip of the pile to a sensor, to a vibration sensor. And this is the peak particle velocity that's measured by the sensor. <clears throat> when the pile is at the top of the ground, it's farthest away from a buried sensor. And as the pile tip gets closer and closer to the sensor, we get up to a maximum value. And here, what is that? That's about uh, uh, um, yeah, six inches per second. But then as the pile goes by the sensor, now well, there's a bit of a dip here, but generally we have a relatively stable vibration amplitude, and that is generated by both the, uh, uh, the P wave coming from the tip and a shear wave coming from the uh, cylindrical waves. Uh, here, for a given site, you can see the different distances. This is closest, sensor closest, intermediate, and farthest. The behaviors are about the same. The amplitudes are lower. Now, uh, it's, it's also possible with any two measured values to calculate an alpha, attenuation coefficient. So these are sensors at three different distances at the same depth, three different distances. You can get an alpha from A3 to A4, or from A3 to A5, or A4 to A5. We get all three of those alphas, average them. This is the value, and then apply it, and this is the curve. Now, we can also calculate the particle motion at the interface, you know, we know how to do that with the shearing strength um, of the soil. And we plot a point there. Now, I'm not saying that that plotted point, that calculated point is, is very accurate, but it doesn't have to be for, for plotting this curve. You can, you can see the size of the dot and it will, will uh, fit that data point. But the point is it's, it's a reasonable approximation of what we expect to happen. Along the surface then, we also had the geophones uh, from a distance of uh, uh, two meters and farther on, and this is what the surface geophones measured and the alpha from that. So values of, of uh, attenuation coefficient were fit in the, the um, um, hypothetical model and I, I showed you that uh, earlier with the alphas way down at the bottom. So we have a situation now, I think, where we're, we are pretty well off in terms of um, estimating uh, particle motion from a impact-driven pile. Uh, we can take care of the energy from the shaft and the tip, and we can combine them. Uh, there's still questions about combining. How do you combine the the to and fro motion with the up and down motion. Yeah? And how do you change from a shearing strain for which we have adopted the earthquake engineering criterion, is that the right one? Maybe we should be using a criterion based upon uh, a vertical strain or volumetric strain, I should say. So I think we are fairly well along in how to do that, oh, I should have gone to this slide, because here are the alphas then that, uh, uh, for each of the strain um, zones. It might be we should have more zones, or maybe less zones, uh, and maybe zones aren't the proper thing to have, but uh, it, it kind of, I think, uh, helps define this model and helps us understand what's going on. Now, uh, the question is, can we calculate what the amplitude might be at a certain distance away from the pile and try to decide whether that 
amplitude of vibration is going to exceed a criterion. Remember, those were the, the sequences we go through the four, four uh, steps. So here is just a spreadsheet with uh, a, a seven layer uh, site, uh, layer thicknesses, uh, layer elevations, but also a unified classification system symbol and blow count. Well, MDOT told us, okay, you're not gonna have anything but blow count, so we make all of the possible corrections to blow count. There are more out here that you don't see. Uh, uh, to uh, have the, the, the uh, appropriate modified blow count to make a judgment about some property. It could be density, it could be friction angle. Uh, those are principal uh, items that we need to know. And, and uh, so, so the soil classification comes in because remember the uh, alpha uh, was in fact uh, a function of plasticity index. Yeah, well, so it's a pretty big step, but we, you have to make some judgment on whether there are fines. With an SP, we say no fines. With a PEAT, okay, that's fines. We have a problem with that. An SP, that's the sand, and that's, of course, what we were generally looking at. An ML, well, there's a question about the plasticity there. And another SP, no plasticity and an SW, and another ML. So the soil classification is used to make a judgment with regard to um, the um, uh, importance of fines uh, in the soil. Again, here are the strain thresholds, and we're looking at something uh, smaller than 0.1%. Now, to adjust the strain amplitude to accommodate um, the amount of fines, a very unimaginative subscript of F for fines. So the equivalent threshold for fines, a soil with fines, is the threshold without fines divided by this factor R sub S. And here's the R sub S. It, and this is a first approximation, please. It's, it's, uh, it has not been verified by other than one, one uh, research study. But of course, if there are no fines, uh, I mean, sorry, no, that, yeah, oh, no fines, then the effect is one. So we'd have, what, percent fines over here, something like 4%. As the percent of fines increases out to, let's say, 25% fines, we come down to the line, and you see the line doesn't go through the data exactly, but the R sub S is 0.1. So we divide the threshold that we saw on the previous slide for no fines by 0.1, and so the strain threshold goes up one order of magnitude. And instead of 0.01 strain threshold, it'll be 0.1 for a, a soil with 25% fines. So that's the correction, and then we carry on with a spreadsheet calculation, and it's just taking those correlations a blow count to friction angle and blow count to unit weight and blow count to whatever, and take our spreadsheet out to the end. We want to calculate shear strain, Z dot over velocity, shear wave velocity, and here at four different distances for each of the seven layers, we have calculated a value of shearing strain. Any time that that shearing strain exceeds the value for that particular layer, layer uh, you see some of these layers remember uh, sand and sand, and this is peat. So the threshold was adjusted, 
And the green uh, shaded uh, areas so show the distance to which we would expect threshold strains to be generated by driving a, a, a pile uh, and, and we were talking about a, probably a, an H pile with a diesel hammer in, in uh, soil profile. So you see here at a distance of 10 feet in layer two, we still have 0 0.011, that's greater than the threshold. And down here, 0 0.015. But at 15 feet, none of the layers would we would expect to um, experience a threshold. So we can generally uh, suggest that if we know peak particle velocity, and that you might have to estimate in the equations that I've provided, and the shear wave velocity, we can enter this chart with a general criterion for whether threshold strains will be exceeded and we're likely to get settlement. You see, if we're up in this region, we have a high risk. If the, in the blue region, it's a moderate, well, it says low risk, and no risk when we have sands down here. At this end of the scale for shear wave velocities, we're going to have loose sands. At this end, we're going to have dense sands. Uh, and this was recently published by Bent for, uh, Felinius from Canada. So in summary, we've looked at, <coughs> excuse me, four conditions associated with uh, vibration analysis, uh, looking at the possibility of causing damage by driving a pile. We looked at source energy and coupling it into the ground. We know how to do those things. We know how to, to uh, attenuate it uh, through the ground and uh, to uh, judge it according to uh, criteria that have been established by various agencies. And so we know generally how to treat the problem. Um, I need to acknowledge those who worked with, with me throughout the last eight years. And uh, uh, these are people from my university and local consultants. And of course, the work was done under the auspices and under the funding of a MDOT under a contract. And uh, with that, I, I quickly run by references. And I wish to thank Shamsher and Sally for this opportunity and honor to make this presentation. If you would like to follow things in the references, uh, you have those uh, uh, printed and available. So thank you very much. I don't know your timing. Uh, I'm a little past uh, where I ought to be, so maybe. We've got time for a couple quick questions. Out of the way. Yes, sir. Dr. Wood, thank you. Uh, could you speak just for a minute about pore pressure and soil moisture and how that affects what you discussed? Uh, yes, j just briefly, what we've been able to observe, and we haven't uh, put um, uh, pore pressure measurement uh, instruments in the ground, but if the soil is partially saturated, it can be treated for shakedown, uh, for strictly shakedown, not pore pressure generation, uh, as, is, as if it had no moisture. And of course, the other side of it is if you have it saturated, then there will be pore pressure measurements. We don't have a quantity, uh, haven't measured the magnitude of the pore pressure buildup. And of course, that's a, uh, uh, also the reason that we can't say much about it is the number of cycles. We know that pore pressure builds with more and more cycles, and we have not, we don't have data to, to uh, enter into that discussion yet. It's on its way, but it's not here yet. <laughs>
Yes. When you did the test, <coughs> was there any difference between when you were driving the pile, when the pile is approaching the sensor, or it has passed the sensor in the radial uh, department of In the radial. Uh, uh, only to the extent that um, the tip of the pile may be in different material. Uh, because if, if the pile is penetrating and goes through a particularly stiff stratum, then the ratio between the shaft and the tip energy will change. So that would mean that, that the <clears throat> vibration amplitude felt at a sensor just above a stiff layer compared to when the pile tip has gotten below that stiff layer, the ratio is going to be different. But you know, th th that, that's so much of a site-dependent individual profile um, question that, that it's hard to answer in general. Otherwise, let's thank Dr. Woods for his uh, talk.